Welcome everybody to the very first episode of the Muskoka Bros podcast. I'm your host, Muskoka Bro Dylan, um, and this podcast is going to be a bit of a pilot idea um, in the sense that it can really only continue if people are interested, so please, listeners, provide any and all feedback, uh, positive or negative, as well as any suggestions you have on format, uh, maybe some topics or anything else like that. With that out of the way, I'll let you in on how the show is going to break down. Um, in the coming episodes, you'll hear us share our favorite camping memories, favorite gear, what we're most looking forward to in the future, how to plan for trips, among many, many other topics related to the outdoors and bushcrafting. To go along with all that, I'll keep you up to date on what the biggest bushcrafters and outdoorsmen and women are up to on their uh, YouTube and Instagrams. Who knows, in future episodes we may even get to interview some of those people, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this segment is going to be called This Week in Wildness. Uh, so this week in wildness we had Joe Robinette doing an ambitious 100-mile uh, trip in seven days with his buddy Mike. That was up in, in Algonquin Park, and he opted to do one long video rather than the series style that he just did for the... The Stranded series, uh, it's certainly an interesting and entertaining watch, but definitely be prepared to strap in for a good two hours. Uh, I think it was two hours and 15 minutes in total. So yeah, have a look at that. Sean James was at his cabin showing us some good old-fashioned cooking skills. He's featured uh, some bear meat burgers, fried green tomatoes, homemade ketchup, which I didn't even know was possible, but alas, you learn something new every day. Uh, be careful watching this one because it will definitely make you hungry. Swift Canoe and Kayak is doing an interview series with notable outdoor figures, and they're looking for input on who to interview. So, I mean, you know, like, if you wanted uh, to mention our name to them, that'd be okay with me. Um, Max over at Woodsman's Finest on Instagram gave us a bunch of great spoon carving content this week, and I checked over on his YouTube channel as well, but the latest video uh, from him on there was back in May. I'm including it here in this section anyways, just because it's a great knife review as well as a, a really cool way to watch his process in a bit more uh, detail for those spoons that he does. And that was really all that was on my radar from the big guys this week, so let's shift over now to our topic of the day, how to eat well in the bush. Now this is going to look different for everyone because you may have different goals. Maybe you're packing light and you're looking to add a bit of pizzazz, or maybe you're like me and you've lugged a cooler halfway into Algonquin Park just so you can mow down on some steak and potatoes. Um, I'm going to do my best to provide some tips for both types and, uh, and hopefully everyone in between as well. So let's start off here with the would-be survivalist. Uh, for you, maybe that means being prepared to fish, forage, and trap for your food, uh, using things like beans, rice, and maybe a military uh, ration to, to supplement. Uh, the first thing that you need to do, and this is really, really important, is you need to ask yourself some questions uh, before you get going. So you want to be, you obviously want to know how long your trip is going to be, can you bring any perishable foods such as cheese, apples, bread, um, anything like that? Are you going to go deep into the park or are you just pulling off the highway and hiking in a bit? Uh, the answers to these questions will start to give you a clearer picture of what you should bring. If you want to go really hardcore, the human body can survive roughly a month or so without any food so long as you have access to clean water. So. I don't recommend doing this one personally just because it can be dangerous. You never know how your body is going to react um, when you're out in the wilderness, You're especially if you're paddling, portaging, and whatever. You definitely uh, you need to have some nutrition with you, um, certainly just to stop yourself from passing out mid-portage or um, in the middle of your, in your middle of the lake in your boat. A friend of mine, actually, when we were in Algonquin once, he obviously didn't have enough food and ended up passing out on a portage and uh, thankfully we were with a really big group and he was actually able to sit down um, in the in the bottom of the canoe with the gear kind of stacked on top of him because he was so woozy he couldn't actually uh, sit up right in the seat and paddle so also it was like two in the morning but that's a, that's a story for another day it's quite uh, it's quite the tale but um, 
anyways, the point of that story is to make sure that you're eating as you're going. Um, there's no shame in taking a, a little food break just to keep yourself from passing out. Uh, next, you need to make sure you have the right gear. So if you're fishing, make sure you've got a fishing rod, you've got your hooks, you've got um, line and spare line and bait, or you've got your lures. Um, and I will say this too, if you're fishing, really make sure that you've researched the lakes you'll be staying on, what kind of fish live there, what sort of activity they're up to at this time of year. Your trusty bass lure is going to be useless to you if the lake only has trout in it. Um, bring extra line just in case. Um, it weighs next to nothing and it will literally be your lifeline if a uh, if fish spools you out. Um, you're also probably going to want a tilly hat of some kind because everybody knows that makes you a better fisherman. If you plan on trapping some small game, you should be bringing wire uh, to make a rabbit snare or even some of that spare fishing line if you're in a pinch. Look around the area you're staying in for signs of activity, uh, you know, poop, paw prints, flattened grass, whatever, little trails and things like that. Um, if you're really adventurous, you could even build or bring a slingshot and do the old bait and wait. I had uh, a friend of mine on our last trip tried a trap where he had some bait at the end of a stick and then uh, a big rock perched on top of that. And the idea was the thing would come and eat the bait and then get smushed by the rock, but he just didn't quite have it. Um, figured out and the next morning the bait was gone but the rock was still there and then later on in the day the wind just blew the rock over anyways so researching what you're going to be doing is always the most important part of um, any sort of survivalist any sort of camping um, experience that you're going to have uh, moving on to foraging, this is also going to begin with researching your area. It's really, really important as you don't want to die from making a simple misidentification of a certain plant, thinking it's edible when it's not. Know your area, know what is edible and inedible. Uh, you can find millions of resources on the internet. Um, you can look at pictures, you can memorize them. If you suck at at memorizing, you can always print those pictures and put them in a Ziploc bag. Uh, there's tons of pocket guides that you can buy. Um, tons of pocket guides you can buy for the area that you'll be in. Really, anything that's going to help you not die. Because at the end of the day, unless you camp for a living, you have a job to get back to the next week. Um, you've got family and friends, so take care of yourself. You know, minimalism while camping depends on preparation. As I mentioned earlier. You probably want to bring something as a backup in case your efforts all fail. I mean, I have a military ration applesauce packet that is 2,500 calories, which is what you need for a day normally. So it weighs next to nothing, so it's really not going to hurt um, to bring it. It would fit in your pocket even if you wanted to do it that way. Like if you're really maxed out for space on your on your uh, minimalist backpack. Um Jumping over to the cooler luggers like myself, uh, you still have to be prepared. It's just a different kind of prep. Again, you have to start with the length of your trip, which will determine the size of your cooler, how much ice to bring, are you going to freeze some of the food beforehand to make it last longer, and things of that nature. The trip I did for Labor Day weekend, I brought way too much ice and actually had to make some concessions on what I brought in which was a bit of a bummer because I would have liked to have had a couple pops and maybe some brewskis, but after my food, I had no room for that sort of thing. I did, however, get to freeze some Gatorade bottles as extra ice, which was a nice treat once they thought out a bit, but it definitely wasn't, uh, it wasn't as good as it could have been. A lot of people like to make fun of the guy with the cooler, but I tell you what, it got pretty quiet around the campfire when six of us were munching away on steak and baked potatoes with mushrooms and onions and everything uh, done to perfection over the coals, I might add. So what what is wrong with that, right? They also weren't laughing when we were having pancakes with syrup for breakfast and, and pizza logs for lunch, but hey, each their own. <laughs> I did catch some flack at the launch when one of the other trippers looked at me, looked at my 80 liter bag and my cooler and asked where, uh, and, he, and he asked, uh, so where's the plasma TV? <laughs> <laughs> which actually that was a pretty funny comment I wasn't offended or anything I totally get it um, 
but that was just you know some good lighthearted fun and we're just we we're just doing a three hour trip into Ralph Bice anyway so wasn't really that bad to portage um that big cooler I mean the biggest portage we had I think was a 495 before that it was a 200 and a 100 so really like that's that's no big deal at all um ultimately it boils it all boils down to this question why are you going camping for me personally i go camping to have fun and sometimes fun looks like trying to get by on six or seven cliff bars and my small backpack being cold at night you know being uncomfortable uh pushing my limits seeing what i'm capable of but sometimes fun means dragging a 50 pound cooler around maxing out my 80 liter pack with every comfort i can cram in there and there's no right way to go camping except the way that's going to be the most enjoyable for you as long as you're not being a burden to others by not being able to pull your own weight with your gear or on the flip side being a burden with a holier than thou minimalist attitude looking down your nose at everybody Neither way is fun for the other people you're with, so keep that in mind when you go out. That just about wraps us up for this week. I hope this helps you when you plan your next trip, and in the future we can use this time to answer some questions or feedback that you guys have. And thanks for tuning in, and remember, you just gotta get out there.